A very warm welcome to the 2020 Birmingham School Sport Conference. Um, perhaps we ought to close our eyes uh, for a minute and imagine we've just enjoyed uh, some of Edgebaston's best hospitality, mingled with friends and colleagues we haven't seen for a while before taking our seats. Yeah, maybe next year, eh? Um, so firstly, a big thank you for joining the event. We've had over 100 people signed up before today. And so we're hoping for pretty close to that number um, on the virtual platform, which would be fantastic. Um, I'd like to say in advance a very big thank you to James and the Sport Birmingham team for bringing you a, an absolute sort of top draw lineup of guest speakers for the next two hours. Um, purpose of today um, is to just inform you of current and upcoming initiatives, update you on current planning for the Commonwealth Games and also to celebrate some of the wonderful work that's taking place in Birmingham schools. Um, and you know, during the last six months or so, we've been working really closely with Sport England to fund and support as many clubs, schools and organisations who provide sport and activity. Uh, and this work will continue at pace, particularly focusing on tackling inequalities. Um, the new Sport England strategy will be launched in January 21. And the emerging themes are really encouraging. You know, these are big areas, big issue areas for action now and the longer term. Um, and I just want to read out the four for you, one in particular. Um, first one is building back better and, uh, and fit for the future. There's one big issue about connecting sport and physical activity with health more explicitly. Um, there's one about active environments. And a fourth headline is, is worded as foundations of an active society. And the subtext in the strategy is about improving the experience of children and young people that shape their relationship with movement for life. And these are developing language, but it's interesting to keep a check on that. And we'll be doing some work um, to bring that strategy consultation, that final round of strategy consultation uh, to Birmingham uh, in the next couple of months. And we've set up a Birmingham Community Sport and Physical Activity Alliance to help us do so, and also to respond to the current crisis and also develop our work coordinating and leading the physical activity and well-being legacy for the games. So last couple of minutes from me, I've got a bit of housekeeping here. Um, just before I introduce our first guest speaker, a um, couple of housekeeping notes, not the usual directions for the nearest toilet or fire escape. So um, we've got the staying muted, camera off, uh, please use the chat to pose questions and we will hopefully have time to bring forward a number of these at the end of each session. Um, and also note that the conference is being recorded and there'll be an opportunity to view uh, and share with colleagues and that will be uploaded to our website later today. That's the expectation. So uh, let's get going. It gives me great pleasure to introduce someone I've had the, the pleasure to work with and get to know over the last couple of years. In fact, since uh, Ian came and attended uh, the Birmingham School Games, feels like an eternity ago now, a couple of years ago on a, a very sunny afternoon at King Edward School. Um, so let me welcome Ian Reid, Chief Executive of the Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games. Welcome, Ian. Thanks, Mike. Great, great to be here. And, and just to reiterate your comments about James's organisation, thanks to him for everything he's done in putting this together. So I think my brief mic today is to maybe talk 25 minutes or so and give a give a roundup of where we are with the games, focus a little bit on, on younger people and, and our emerging learning programme. And then I think the plan is to leave 10 minutes or so at the end and, and we can do some questions. So I will try and stick to that. And I believe James is going to drive some slides for me. So James, if you wouldn't mind just moving on to the next slide. Excellent. So look, I'm sure most of you in the, in the audience today are very familiar with the Commonwealth Games, but I, I quite like to start with just some background and some of the highlights of, of the event before we then drop into to Birmingham. I think we'll all recognise that the Commonwealth Games is generally known as, as the friendly games, perhaps a little less serious than the Olympics. But actually, history has shown us that, in particular in the UK, it's been very much the platform for um, our kind of next emerging stars and our next generation of, of heroes and the Commonwealth Games in a lot of cases is where they've really come on to the, to the world spotlight before taking over um, world championships and Olympics and, and really making their name. So 
I'm um, sure that will be the case here with some young emerging athletes through the home nations and, and other countries um, really coming on to the onto the world stage in Birmingham. But actually the, the games is moving into um, b- being a being a movement much more for social change and um, there's been a lot of work recently on its partnerships um, with a number of charities and the last two editions have raised significant amounts of money for, for social change. But actually the Federation now itself, Commonwealth Games Federation, have now started um, their own charity, the Commonwealth um, Sport Foundation, which is looking to um, both engage with the local hosts and ensure that um, we maximise the benefit of the games locally, in this case here in Birmingham, the West Midlands, but also engaging right across the Commonwealth and making sure um, that Commonwealth sport, as it's now known, um, provides a wider role rather than just putting an event on for every four years, but actually looks to develop sport right across the Commonwealth family. And of course, it's a hugely inclusive event. Um, it is the first and only multi-sport event which features an integrated parasport programme for elite athletes with a disability. Hugely proud of that and works incredibly well. I think all the fans that come to the Commonwealth Games um, love the fact that they are watching um, both that integrated programme and the athletes in particular really love the fact it's a single team environment. And in Birmingham, actually, we will have the largest parasport program uh, of any Commonwealth Games ever. So really delighted about that. And then we will also, um, for the first time ever, have actually slightly more medal events for women than men. Um, so we are talking about this as being the most inclusive multi-sport event that there has ever been. Um, so one we can all be very proud of. James, if you could move on to the next slide, please. So some of you may have seen some of these statistics before, but I thought it'd just be helpful um, to take you through the kind of scale of what's coming to the West Midlands. So just in terms of the Commonwealth itself, we have 72 Commonwealth nations. Of course, it's not like the Olympics where UK um, or Great Britain perform under a single banner, but actually it's the home nations um, and a number of associated dependent territories as well. So 72 nations. Um, it was 71, for those of you who keep close notice of the Commonwealth, but the Maldives was recently invited back in, hence we're up to 72. I have offered to make a personal visit to welcome the Maldives to the Commonwealth Games, but so far I've not heard anything back on that. Um, we've got 11 days of sport starting the 28th of July 2022, and we estimate just over actually 6,500 athletes and officials staying across the Commonwealth Games villages. Not just the Birmingham Games, I know Birmingham is in the title, but very much a regional showcase across the West Midlands. So I'll come on to the, the venue footprint, but we've got venues right across the region from the Black Country down to Coventry and Warwickshire. Um, only one venue out with the West Midlands and that's track cycling in, in London. Um, we expect, based on previous figures, to have at some point up to 1.5 billion global TV spectators, and currently we think we've got about 1.4 million tickets or so for sport to sell. But of course, over and above that sport, there is an extensive games cultural program which will take place primarily around the six months shoulder period of the event itself. And that we think alone will engage up to 1 million people in addition to the 1.4 million people that are engaging with the sport. Um, huge opportunity and we recognise um, currently that the, the boost economically that the Games can give the region is more important than ever. Um, we have around 43,000 Games time roles. That's everything from working full time in the organising committee like myself and colleagues. Um, there are 10 to 12,000 volunteer opportunities and then anywhere up to about 30,000 contractors who will be working on the Games and a good number of those contractors will be looking for workforce locally to support their endeavours as well. So a huge amount of local opportunity and we'll come on and talk later about how we're trying to support young people in accessing um, some of those opportunities. Um, the great thing about Birmingham, 95% of the venues um, are in place for our event. Um, there are only two major capital projects, one being the Alexander Stadium where a new stand is going in there as we speak. And the second is a brand new aquatic centre in, in Sandwell which is progressing very well, but everything else is in place, is used regularly for, for world-class events, um, and we're delighted to work with all the teams across those venues. 
So based on the previous Commonwealth Games and the Gold Coast, um, the event should bring an economic boost to the region in excess of a billion pounds. Um, very timely, and we are taking our obligations incredibly serious, seriously to make sure that that economic benefit flows through to local businesses and local people. Um, and in terms of those contracts, we have around um, £300 million of organising committee games contracts, which we hope in the majority, as I say, will reach local and regional um, suppliers. So we are, the last point there, a lot of you may have noticed in the, in the media over the last month or two, one of our challenges around COVID in particular has been the Athletes Village. Um, the Athletes Village was planned to be um, at Perry Bar in the north of Birmingham. Um, unfortunately, we could not on the basis that that construction site went down for a number of weeks um, during COVID. We, we could not uh, commit to that um, being available um, with the confidence levels we all required for the game. So we have moved the Commonwealth Village solution from Perry Bar to, um, to three sites, actually, the University of Birmingham, the University of Warwick, and a campus at the NEC. Um, it's not perfect. We'd ideally like to have kept all the teams in one place, but actually there are some advantages in that. Athletes will now be much closer to their venues, um, their sustainability benefits, but also performance benefits. A lot of them will be able to walk to training and competition from where they are staying. But the most important thing in the last point in that slide is from a legacy perspective, um, the government and um, Birmingham City Council have committed to still build those 1,400 new homes in Perry Bar. Um, so the regeneration of the area will not be impacted um, by the fact we're not using it for the 11 days of, of sport. James, if we, could, if we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, some of you may have seen this, but I'll just quickly run through it. Um, right at the outset of setting up the Games Partnership and the Organising Committee for Birmingham 2022, um, we were keen to obviously lock down our overall mission for what we were going to deliver. And what we did in doing that was speak to thousands of people from across the region and simply ask them what they would um, expect to see or what they wanted from a Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games. And these were the five themes that come through. Just to quickly run through them, first one around bringing people together. People said to us, the games like no other opportunity could really bring um, everyone from this hugely diverse region together to deliver it, whether that's be a volunteer, whether it be in a mass cast as a ceremony, whether it's simply buying tickets, um, whether it's being uh, involved in the workforce and huge opportunities. Um, Bit of feedback people were saying to us that there are still some communities in the region who tend to do business, socialise and engage in their own communities. And this is a real opportunity to fully integrate right across the West Midlands. The second one, and of course, hugely relevant to, to today is that desire to improve health and well-being. And we are well aware of some of the challenges in leaving long lasting um, change and benefit from multi-sport events. I think we always we would all recognise that you you do get that blip in, in uptake, but actually to make it last is a real challenge. So um, there is a full health and wellbeing legacy work stream um, led actually by Mike uh, Asakondi into Mike's team from Sport England, but very much through the Sport Birmingham team. Um, some great work going on there and some fantastic projects that hopefully will run um, and continue to run long after the games themselves. Um, the third one, um, this was set before our challenges with COVID, but as I mentioned earlier, more important than ever in terms of um, the economic benefit that the Games can bring, and alongside the likes of HS2, um, these are real gifts, I think, for the region in terms of a period where there's going to be significant job losses and economic challenges. There are some projects in the West Midlands that hopefully can contribute to that, to that recovery, and we, we take our role in that incredibly seriously. Um, the catalyst for change one was people telling us really about the fact that there will be some infrastructure change. I mentioned the two capital projects for the games, but also there's a lot of transport infrastructure works going on across the region and people reminding us that they don't want white elephants and they want those venues and that infrastructure to work for the long term. And very much the, the construction associated with Birmingham 2022 is not focused on the 11 days of sport. It's primarily designed to work and engage with communities longer term. Uh, and the Sandwell Aquatic Centre is a great example of that, where actually it is very much designed with the community in mind, um, but we are making it work for the Games, and that's absolutely the right way around. And then finally, from a Birmingham uh, and West Midlands perspective, um, a lot of feedback about this is our chance to really change some of those long-lasting 
negative perceptions of, of Birmingham, which um, should not be the case now. I know a lot of people haven't visited the city for a long period of time, and if they did come here, I'm sure those um, perceptions would, um, would dissipate immediately. But actually, this is the the big tourism, trade, investment type moment to put the to put the city and the region on the map. Those 1.5 billion TV viewers, all those spectators engaging with sport and the cultural community coming into the city um, and we, if we deliver something special and we get those broad broadcast moments right um, then this could be a real game changer in terms of the future um, of the city and the region. James if we could just move on. So focusing then on sport which I know a lot of you um, in the audience are really interested in just as a quick reminder what sports are on our Commonwealth Games programme so um, the marquee multi-sport um, sports you'd expect to be there in aquatics and athletics um, a lot of the traditional commonwealth sports actually um, so squash netball rugby sevens lawn bowls in there and um, a lot of the racket sports and the combat sports that are normally in commonwealth games remain in, in the birmingham program but actually um, some new sports in there as well which is about really engaging both youth um, and and the diverse communities across the west midlands so we're delighted to add recently um, both beach volleyball um, and women's cricket. Women's cricket, hugely growing sport, absolutely resonates with a lot of the big communities um, in the region and hugely excited about that. And 2022 is very much um, in the UK in particular a summer of, of women's sports. So there is also the European Women's Football Championships taking place in England um, just in, in advance of our event. There's a slight overlap actually. Um, and we very much see a narrative coming out of that um, women's football event transferring um, into the Commonwealth Games and our um, bigger women's medal programme and the likes of women's cricket being able to shout about um, women's sport, I think is a real opportunity. Uh, but then, as I mentioned, three on three basketball and beach volleyball um, in the programme, I think, takes the Commonwealth Games to be more relevant um, for younger people, sports that young people will, will really engage with. Um, three on three basketball has not been in the games before, but beach volleyball was in the Gold Coast. And for any of you, if you were lucky enough to either be there or to watch it on TV, you would have seen a real festival built around that venue and um, be that DJ's party atmosphere. And people used to come there, even if they didn't have tickets, um, just because it was it was a place to be in and a real party over the over the eleven days. So really excited about that one, and I'll come on to talk a little bit later about where that's taking place and how we're trying to um, really bring that into the city. James, if we could, if we can move on to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so if we can keep going. So in terms of kind of recent developments, uh, and it's a good link to my last point. So we, we have now pretty much locked down the full um, games venue footprint. Um, these were the last few announcements that, that you can see in front of you. So. We are now um, going to put three on three basketball and wheelchair basketball alongside beach volleyball right into the centre of Birmingham. So there's a big vacant site just um, south of the bull ring, the old market site called Smithfield. Um, it looks, as you can see there, pretty barren at the moment. Um, but when we build out um, two, two huge four or 5,000 seat arenas, um, one for each of those sports, likely a large live site beside it, and build our look program in there, I think it will look incredible. And the backdrop, as you can see for broadcast, is also spectacular. So hugely excited about those. I think um, it really does, as I say, bring the bring the games right into the city, allows people to come and interact with it, even if they don't have tickets for the sports. They'll, this will be the place to be, I am sure. Um, and uh, yeah, really exciting. So we've we've launched that. We've brought some of the athletes, as you can see, down to, sh to, to show them it. And, um, they absolutely fell in love with with it and the uh, opportunity that that brings. So that locks that down. We'd spent quite a lot of time looking around the region to um, to find an appropriate venue, but I'm absolutely delighted working with the city that we've managed to get that one. And then um, in terms of the road cycling, both the time trial and road race, we announced the venues for those just a couple of weeks ago, actually. Um, so this was very much about our desire to make sure the Games does spread right across the full West Midlands and whilst having Sandwell uh, at the edge of the Black Country that there wasn't anything else there so we're determined to get some more into the 
black country and therefore we announced West Park as a start and finishing line for the time trial event in Wolverhampton. Um, that, that route is not yet finalised, but will likely go through um, the vast majority of the black country and certainly the big conurbations there. So hugely enthusiastic support from everyone in Wolverhampton to get that over the line um, and delighted to do that. And then at the other end of the region, um, we announced that the road race would actually be taking part down, uh, taking part, sorry, down in Warwick. Um, so the start finishing line of St. Nicholas Park in Warwick. And again, a route right across that region. Huge history in cycling already held the British Championships and others. So um, they, they've been very supportive as well. So as I say, that, that pretty much locks everything down. Obviously the details of some of those routes and the marathon routes and others are still to be worked out. But in terms of core venues, then we, we are clear where everything is now um, for the games. Um, if we move on, James. And, and, and then also recently we announced the fact that we, are, uh, we have entered into a partnership. So um, a significant financial commitment to the games and supporting the games from the University of Birmingham. But also the great thing from our perspective is there's so much they can bring to supporting delivery of the games. So not just the fact that they are a host venue. So you can see there they're hosting hockey as well as squash. Um, and they are also one of our village sites, as I mentioned earlier now. But um, their offer up of significant research support, um, work on the legacy space, um, secondees from their student population. Um, it's a real, it's a really great partnership, and I'm absolutely delighted that, that the VC David there at the University of Birmingham has made that commitment with his team um, to get involved in the games. If we keep moving, James. <laughs> And then another another few things just to flag. So we we ran a really successful recently um, virtual mascot summit. Like like yourselves here today, would have loved to have been in a room with lots of creative children, but unfortunately we had to do it um, over systems like this. But huge engagement didn't, fronted up there, as you can see by Denise Lewis, with thousands of applications uh, and some incredible drawings from from kids across three age groups. Um, and actually, the fact it was over school holidays and things, I think helped um, get, get, get them something to do and, and get us a real um, quality response. So we've now, um, through our athlete colleagues and some of our uh, educationalists on our Legacy and Benefits Committee have assessed all of those submissions. They have a recommendation for a winner, which um, has just been finalized through the various governance that it needs to go to, but we hope to launch that um, mascot in the next um, probably in the next month or so, I would hope. <clears throat> and, and the mascot's always a huge, hugely powerful engagement tool for us. We'll um, take that to a huge number of schools across the region um, and it will very much become the face of the game. So um, really exciting. So what's the space for that one? And um, we've also been um, out both across the region and nationally to, um, to, to make sure that we get a really quality um, response in relation to the training venues that the games require, but also um, training camps as well. So the difference there being training camps are there will be a number of the bigger teams will come into the region um, prior to the games and set up acclimatisation camps and try and bring their teams together. So working closely with DCMS and UK Sport, they're offering a brokerage service where they're engaging with the teams and then all the various um, training camp options for facilities there. And then also training venues, which um, are during games time, um, if there are quality venues for a number of our sports within a 30 minute drive from the village, then we want to hear about them. So we've been engaging with a huge number of facilities attached to schools, community groups, sports clubs, um, right across the region. And it's a great chance for them to be truly involved in the games and get some elite world-class athletes into their, uh, into their facilities. And then lastly, we're putting a huge focus on apprenticeships, both for school leavers and, and, and others. And we've made a commitment ourselves within the organising committee to put a good number, I think maybe between 30 and 40 apprenticeships in the market ASAP. But much more importantly than that, um, we are forcing our supply chain um, to do that and expect that to convert into hundreds and hundreds of apprenticeship opportunities linked to the games. Um, so therefore, we will now start to roll that out. In fact, I think the first six or seven from our organisation are already advertised on our website, um, but um, watch this space, there'll be a lot more coming through. 
And the first of our sort of big, big contracts was awarded to our host broadcaster. So that's the company that will effectively film the game. So um, they will um, have the workforce and the technology at, at every venue filming the games. And they've committed to take, um, I think, up to 200 people through training and apprenticeship programs associated with that contract, some of which I, I am sure will lead to longer term jobs as well. So at company Sunset and Vine, who um, broadcast a lot of sports, and we're hugely thankful for them for that commitment. But we expect a lot more, so um, a lot of opportunity for young people to, to get involved in school leavers there um, through the apprenticeship program. Um, so I'm conscious of the audience. So I thought I would just spend the last five, 10 minutes or so just talking about um, young people and, and opportunities. We've made a firm commitment in, in everything we do. If we can keep, keep moving, James, we, we will involve young people, whether that's um, all the promotional um, side of the games in terms of unveiling venues, as you can see there, confirming our sports programme, all our celebrations about three and two years to go. Um, we always try and put young, young people at the heart of it. And it's been great actually travelling around the region and to, to schools and clubs and meeting a, a huge number of them um, who are hugely enthusiastic about the games. But both the young people and, and a lot of the coaches um, working with them um, have, have really embraced what we're trying to do um, with the games and really supporting us. So that's been fabulous. And um, if we keep going, James, and as I, as I said, that that's led through to, you know, the fact how we've developed the mascot is all um, with the local schools network um, and how we've promoted um, both the construction sites and um, big launches has all been done um, and very much led um, by, by school children and other young people from across the West Midlands. But um, one, one of the big um, one of the big opportunities I think is um, a pro program which we're starting to develop now, which is the Commonwealth Games Learning Program. Um, it's in its infancy, um, and we all need a lot of your support in the room and, and your colleagues. But we want to develop a wide ranging educational program um, which will very much help bring the, the Commonwealth Games um, to right across the region, as I said earlier, but really enabling young people to play their part in the games. And that's everything from ring fencing, some volunteer roles, so those sports specific roles where all the really exciting volunteers who are on the field of play, now that might just be carrying balls on or taking uniforms away or whatever else, but we'll make a commitment that they are young people and they will be the people they will get to meet um, those inspiring athletes. Uh, so, so, so that's already on our agenda and flowing right through to, to our um, ceremonies and our cultural programme to, to be performing in front of you know, 30,000 people in, in Alexander Stadium, but potentially up to a billion from across the Commonwealth on, a, on an opening ceremony will, will be a once in a lifetime opportunity. And we will make sure that that, that goes to, to the majority of the young people uh, in that cast. And, Martin, our Chief Creative Officer, has already made that commitment. And he's even looking now at um, our Queen's Baton Relay, which is around taking um, children right around the Commonwealth. So the Queen's Baton leaves, um, it leaves the Buckingham Palace, I think, around October. And COVID permitting allows us to, to visit every Commonwealth country before coming back to the UK. Uh, and that's traditionally got a, a quite standard delivery model and there's people that do this for Olympics and other things. However, we are looking into whether we actually take um, a good number of young people from the region on that journey or perhaps parts of that journey, get them to experience it, but also get them to record it and get them to use their social media. They, they know how to engage with other young people much better than, than the vast majority of my team do. Um, so trying to create those life-changing experiences there. But the learning program itself, um, the overall strategic priority um, is to engage with people aged five to 30, the majority probably being in schools, um, and really make sure that we inspire, empower, and activate the, the voice of young people um, and use them to provide that springboard for change. So that's the overarching aims of what we're trying to do. But James, if you just move on to the next slide. Um, and that, that, will, that will take the, the form of kind of three themes. Um, firstly, um, talking about a journey to 2022, so very much around individuals. So um, the programme is going to seek to challenge and support young people to make um, their own life choices, embrace opportunities and become happier and healthier in the lead up to, to the Games. 
Secondly, finding common ground across the communities to help young people to learn about, understand and celebrate similarities and differences between themselves and, and other young people. And then outwardly looking to society as well around um, changing the world and helping young people to change their community and, and society for the better. So um, those have been agreed by, by the partnership around the overarching themes. Um, but now we need to take that and, and actually deliver the programme. So James, if we drop the next slide, what, what we're doing as we speak right now, and I think the adverts just closed, but we're in the interview process, is recruiting for the full-time team to, to deliver the, the games learning programme. Um, um, they will be on board before the end of the calendar year, I would hope. And uh, early next year, they will have a decent programme built out um, and, and engaging with a number of um, the schools uh, and relevant agencies across the region, sharing ideas and then getting signed up to, to the programme to support it. Um, we hope to have the programme up and running probably about this time next year uh, and it running um, through schools engagement right through um, to just in advance of the games when, when school closes in the summer um, of 2022. And then been a number of links, as I said earlier, to coming out of that programme and potentially linking uh, into opportunities to participate in, in the games itself. So trying to create that link um, so that so that people can get some some real valuable output at the end of it. And and uh, you know one of the key things for us is that that, that program will be very um, it'll be age relevant. So we'll we'll do a lot of fun stuff for, for younger children and I mentioned the mascot earlier and, and try and get the games get get excitement up for the games around around those younger groups. But actually um, in terms of older children, um, perhaps using the likes of the Queen's Baton really to, to provide a development and education programme. And um, history would tell you a lot of schools have tended to follow that Queen's Baton really journey and, uh, and understand and learn about the modern Commonwealth, but also have open and honest conversations about the history of um, how the Commonwealth came about, um, all good, bad uh, and indifferent as well, and be, and be very open and honest um, about that. So. Um, a lot of work still to still to be to be done in this area. If anyone um, has got any views on um, how we should approach that, then I'm happy to join you up with the new team as soon as they're developed. But uh, but really an exciting initiative that that we hope will, as I say, will be up and running um, in in about in about three or four months' time. Um, so I'll, I'll draw breath there. I'm conscious that's a huge amount of information. I think there's ten minutes left or so to your next agenda item, but. Last thing to say is, if you haven't visited our website, um, it's worth doing, um, not because it looks great, I'd say that anyway, but actually because there's a huge amount of information on there around a number of the things I've talked about today, from job opportunities, from how businesses can get involved, from um, the development of our United by 2022 programme, which Mike and his colleagues are involved in, which is around engaging um, programmes in the third sector. Um, so it's definitely worth a look at that and it also includes a timeline on there for when some of our big milestones are coming up so volunteering applications and um, when you can buy tickets and um, etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, please do take the time to have a look and um, but that's for me so um i'll pause there and uh back to you mike and happy to take questions on anything games related thank you ian uh, thank you very much i know you're a ridicu ridiculously busy man um but I always admire how much you uh, take time and prioritise uh, speaking yourself and fronting these sort of events. So, so thank you. I'm sure there's a lot for people to digest uh, and it's good to hear it just straight from you as well. Uh, and a lot of things, it's exciting because a lot of things are now and just bubbling and beginning to, uh, to be more visible for, to everyone. So I've been monitoring. Um, yeah, we've got about just shy of 10 minutes. Uh, I don't know where that half an hour has flown by. We're first question in. Um, how does the Commonwealth Games legacy propose to even up the public realm within Birmingham and give rich, poor, everyone equal opportunity uh, to improve their health? So particularly a uh, particular question around uh, with a nod to tackling inequalities, I think. Yeah, and, and Mike, you should jump in after me as well on this one. But, but I think from a Games perspective, we're acutely aware that Traditionally, a lot of the games opportunities will tend to go to people who will actively push and encourage and, and apply for those opportunities. And sometimes that means um, that perhaps those from more deprived communities across the region and, and host region um, are left out. And, and that's something we are 
we were acutely aware of and trying to trying to avoid. So I'll come back to health in a minute, but in terms of all the opportunities to engage with the games, as I said earlier, be that um, getting a job with the games, be that being a volunteer, um, we've got quite clear metrics about how that will reflect the region. And when we talk about reflecting the region, we don't just mean people delivering the games um, from every single part of the West Midlands. We also mean focusing on, on the various demographics as well to make sure that games delivery and benefit can come um, to, to everybody, not, not just those um, who perhaps have access to technology, equipment and support to be, to be able to apply. So um, so that's the first thing. We, we've invested recently quite heavily now in um, an engagement team um, that, that will be out regularly in a lot of those communities to make sure um, that they are supported and, and getting that access. And on the legacy side, so there's, there's, there's a reasonable um, there's a reasonable governance structure now around the, the legacy delivery. I think it's taken us a little bit of time to get there, but we've got a very strong legacy and benefits committee with um, some of the influencers in the region, but much more importantly, some very good people um, who um, either are, we've got, for example, school teachers, we've got people who work with young people regularly on that committee and who really understand um, the region. And they are challenging us, and rightly so, to, to address the point that, that you've just made, um, Ewan. So um, in relation to that, there, there are a number of programmes, which I haven't mentioned today, but skills programmes in terms of guaranteeing jobs for um, a number of the, those communities we refer to. There are um, programmes around um, making sure, as I said earlier, that the, the game's legacy health and well-being work stream, of which Sport Birmingham are a key part of, um, works for the longer term and not just for um, for the eleven days of sport. And I don't know, Mike, if you maybe want to if you maybe want to just pick that point up around what your team's doing linked to that le le legacy committee to to try and address that issue. Yeah, I'm happy to briefly. I don't want to steal your time. Um, and I think um, yes, there's been an awful lot of work going on with legacy planning behind the scenes. And uh, yeah, times against us, but that that work will now start becoming uh, more public, and we we're going to be, you know, using uh, events like this and other platforms to engage our partners more and and start talking about it and sharing and getting the ideas. Uh, brought forward um, and that physical activity and well-being legacy is, is split up itself into a number of themes one of them specifically children and young people and we've had a couple of really good calls 30 or 40 people on those calls contributing uh, from education and from community uh, work those that work with young people so we're getting we're getting heard now it's only at the start and it needs to go much broader and, and much broader across the region but that is, that process has started uh, and it needs to accelerate. So uh, we'll welcome that, Ian. Um, I'm going to run to another question. Um, we've got maybe two or three just lined up and that will round us up for the next couple of minutes. Um, question here, is there an opportunity for schools to include Commonwealth sports in their curriculum and after school clubs, in example, volleyball, three by three basketball? Um, yeah. Yeah, look, absolutely. So. Um, th there's no formal process to do that at the moment, but we are happy to provide that broker service. So if there, if there are sports that you think would resonate within your school or you would like to you know, put in place some sort of informal Commonwealth program, sport program suite of, of education, then we are happy to make those links between um, the, the relevant governing, bo governing bodies and what support and, and information you require to do that through our sport team, um, we would be happy to offer that service, Mike. Um, I know Matt, who our director of sports, hugely passionate about getting some of those sports um, down to young people and, and, and engaging young people in them and those ones that perhaps are, are less popular right now. So he would be um, he'd be happy to do that. So I don't know, Mike, if whoever's asked the question, if, if you want to drop me a note after or, or, or pass on our email addresses and we can make sure that we can start those conversations. Yeah, I'll happily pass that on and, and, and to say um, that, that is, uh, that's something very much accelerating at the moment that we, we, we're trying to bring all the national governing bodies of those Commonwealth sports, talking with ourselves, Sport England and Matt from, the, um, from Ian's team um, to get a, you know, a real understanding of what their individual sport legacy ambitions are for Birmingham and the region. Uh, and that's exciting because there's a lot, obviously a lot of 
a lot of interest in in doing that and we need to make sure that those benefits are seen in schools as well as the community so yes um another one nearly there how will the games ensure that spectating at the games is as inclusive and accessible as possible yeah so so actually this is an area that we've been putting a huge amount of focus on so we've obviously got a dedicated and accessibility within within the games um, we have launched what we're calling the um, the big inclusive or the Birmingham inclusive games standard which will be in the website it's worth having having a read at that and that's Focus not just on making sure all the venues themselves are fully accessible for, for athletes and spectators, but also working closely with the local authorities to make sure those journeys um, from train stations, bus stations, and etc., and, and the available transport is fully accessible for everyone that wants to engage in the games. And actually, I'm confident that that will leave a legacy behind as well. You know, that, that there will be a um, a real push to get this in place, and rightly so for the games. But I'm sure a lot of it will will, long, will last long after that. But you know, in terms of inclusive as well, um, one of, one of the areas that we uh, that I mentioned earlier was about engagement. But it's also about making sure all communities um, feel a part of the games. And alongside that engagement team, we're also um, recruiting, as we speak now, ahead of equality, diversity, and inclusion. And that's focused not just in our internal culture. But making sure that we're engaging um, with all ethnicities across the region as well. So I'm, I'm confident that we, we will have a very accessible um, and inclusive games and we've got some excellent people um, working in that space with us um, and some great ambassadors from even people like Tani Gray Thompson who's given her time really really uh, generously to us to, to support all of that work that's going on in our, in our accessibility teams. And the dreaded mute, haven't I? Um, one final one. How do schools get involved in uh, in the learning programme? If you if you've got anything from that information on that, and what benefits can schools receive with the games being here? I suppose the second one's a big one, but specifically schools engagement. Yeah, look on the first point. It, it, it's a it's a work in progress. Unfortunately, right now I don't have the specific process by which um, we we can. Uh, we can do that joining up, but but it will be in place in the next few months when the team work all that through. So, you know, we've got a desire to try and engage every school in, in the region. So you will hear from us um, and we'll make that available through the various networks um, as soon as we have it. So that there's, that's definitely a commitment from myself. Um, and then how can schools benefit? So I think the, the two things are linked. I think the learning programme will, will be all encompassing and, and ensure that schools are fully involved in the games. As I said, there'll be lots of opportunities for school children as well to, to actually be involved in the delivery of the event. I think um, there are also, there's a huge amount um, in the cultural programme, which we maybe haven't talked about um, so much today around, um, that's a grant giving um, programme and will, will involve not just the elite culture and cultural institutions in the city, but actually it's around grassroots involvement so I'm sure a huge number of clubs with young people in the region will, will, and schools will be able to access um, that that money as well um, and then we will undoubtedly have engagement programs for schools at games time in terms of ticket allocations and um, live sites and, and other things to make sure that there's the ability for schools to to physically attend um, as well so huge amount of opportunity, but the learning programs are, as I watch this space at the moment, but we will be getting back to the next few months. Wonderful. Thanks, Ian. Um, and we're just on time. So on behalf of everyone listening, I'd like to uh, thank you uh, very much for your time. We've stole about an hour of your day. Um, so I wish you a good rest of the day. And uh, I mean, it's safe to say that uh, colleagues on the call uh, from the meetings that I've had, you know, just excited to want to be involved. So um, there's going to be no short of energy and enthusiasm to uh, to help you and your team um, engage with them and make a difference. So uh, thanks for your time, and um, I'll let you uh, I'll let you get on. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Megan. Good luck for the rest of the Thank of you. the program. Thanks. Bye bye. Um, that's great. We're not doing comfort breaks because we're just trusting that everyone will will take their own comfort breaks and we'll we'll keep to our tight schedule. Um, our next presenter is Steve Caldicott, Health and Safety 
lead um, for AFP. Um, I'd like to welcome Steve uh, to talk to us now. Welcome, Steve. Okay, thank you. Um, we're Thank you for inviting me today and we seem to be working um, south with our accents so I uh, hope you can understand my Mancunian droves. We've got um, quite a lot of slides, more than I would usually use, but there's quite a few things to say and I will whiz through them. Unfortunately Mancunians do speak quite quickly anyway so we should be okay. Uh, and you'll see the, you know, why there's so many because we really wanted to shoehorn as much as we possibly could in. Um, so. Uh, you'll hear me quite a lot of times saying next slide. Uh, just before I do start is I am the health and safety lead officer. So we've actually embedded some questions that are very common at the moment. And we're also thinking more holistically about curriculum design. Uh, and one of my other roles is as a, a, a practicing inspector at this moment in time, which is probably why my children haven't spoke to me for a few years. So I try to bring that in and think about how we might influence the curriculum in the school setting. And now we have Sue Horned in, in the absence of Sue Wilkinson today, just a couple of slides at the end on the PE premium. So that's that's something I've just tried to tag into to help you. So that's first, next well. slide, please. So this is where we're going with it, is we want the, the principles around this so we can keep PESPA, PE, school sport, physical activity, high profile on the curriculum, absolutely vital with what's going on. And I think you'll see that the sort of passion we have for that in a moment. And almost to step back 12 months to refocus on curriculum, because what I was doing, uh, say 12 months ago, was really looking at the opportunities that the the new education inspection framework was given to us because it wasn't wasn't perhaps as oppressive as people felt others had been. So we were in a really good place. And of course, this dreaded disease came along. So I don't want to lose sight of that and trying to give us some hope as we move forward. So that's the structure of this. So the first slide, please. It is about interpretation. It is about opinion. We're in quite a an awkward situation at the moment where everybody's got an opinion and somebody else has got an opposite opinion and you know we've got the politics of it we've got the education of it. it's, it's quite a it's quite an awful time in many ways so it, so really what we wanted to say is it is you, you your view is important as is everybody else's and we need to have this nice place now really and what we'll see is that there isn't a right and a wrong there is an interpretation and i think that's what we certainly need to keep uh, as we go through this and that's hopefully reflected in the presentation itself so next slide please here's here's what we're, we're thinking about have we actually had six months lost that's why i keep hearing have we had six months lost there have been students who've been um doing their work at home for six months and there have been those that actually couldn't weren't able to do that is it lost are they where they should be what is where they should be what does that even mean? Do we actually put some arbitrary markers in our education system? So maybe there isn't, but if there is something that's been lost, I would argue that it's physical education because children, those that have been engaging effectively, have been working well in their rooms. They've been doing all what you might call the academic subjects and they've lost the physical. And you'll see from a quote later that um, fitness, is some children are actually really struggling with fitness at the moment, so just to actually undertake some of the key tasks that they would have done previously. So P is vital. And I do wonder, sometimes we've got some SLT who are really on board and others that might need convincing. Um, and maybe they need convincing because they're not too sure how to do what we're doing in this COVID environment and keep it safe, which we'll try to address. And the Association for P's website certainly pushes further on that with some of the frequently asked questions. So. In terms of PE, there is a real argument around physical, emotional, cognitive and social development. All things there that I've listed are on the posters I'm going to show you in a moment that AFIA produced. But interestingly, they are actually in the national curriculum anyway for physical education and wider. So if we teach physical education, we contribute to each of those. So the next two slides I'm going to show you are what the those that AFPI have produced to help you in you know thinking about that contribution and convincing others where need be. So next slide, please. These are the posters from the Association for Physical Education. There are two of them. This is the first one. They, they are available on the AFPI website. And effectively, what this is showing is how this subject can contribute to physical, to emotional, 
to so to social and cognitive, or in other words, that real thinking side of uh, education. And there are some examples of how you might get that going again to reactivate your learning. And they are only examples because my experience, uh, certainly when I, I published a book in 2011 on deep learning, we gave examples of things that we thought you could do to encourage things such as resilience and creativity, but they're just examples. And the teachers themselves then look at this and the range of things that comes out there is amazing. So we have great trust in teachers. This is just a prompt maybe to help you. And then the second poster on the next slide, please, is just expands it further. So there's a two part thing that hopefully could either be shared with your key staff or used to influence as and when. And I'm not going to go through that. You can all read and they are available on the website. It was just a question of pointing you to useful resources that the Association for Physical Education is producing at the moment. Next slide, please. This to me is really important. We are in these, what we might call these COVID times. People are talking about a new normal and you'll see from the, the start of my presentation, I'm refusing to go down this new normal. I'm calling it a temporary new normal. I'm hoping we have, uh, uh, you know, go back to somewhere like we were in the future. And I'm hoping that's what we get to. So it is a question now we step, we have to reset, but step back to think where we were perhaps nine months ago, not lose sight of those principles because uh, one, one of the re reasons for that will become quite clear as, as I work through. So next slide, please. You'll, uh, I'm sorry to haunt you with this, but there it is again. That slide we were looking at from quite a while ago, it's still there. Um, and what the reason for showing that is there's a great freedom now because Ofsted, uh, the education and inspection framework itself, was certainly considering the importance of other subjects far further than it used to be in previous uh, inspection frameworks. And I've been working in inspection for about 20 years and I was genuinely excited by this framework. So I think we need to take a step back and go back to this and think, well, let's, let's plan for our ideal here and keep in mind what we've got. And that the quality of education box, which is on the left hand side, and certainly, you know, we'll start to inspect potentially again in January. That is always the focus. It is about the curriculum, the intent, the implementation and impact. They're just words for often inspections. You don't need to use them if you don't want. But in other words, you want a real good curriculum designed. You then structure it out and then you see what difference you're making. It's a research process. So I've, I've thrown that one back in again to remind us where we were. So the next slide, please. There's some of the wording for these next three slides. The next three slides are just some of the words. Uh, if you go back one, please. Yeah, the next three uh, sections of this slide are the intent, the implementation impact. And I've just drawn out some of the key words to remind us, take us that step back for a few minutes to see what should be done on a high quality curriculum. And it's got to be ambitious. It's got to be designed for all pupils with SEND pupils in particular, they're the only group that's explicitly mentioned now, and you see the importance of the inclusivity afterwards. It needs to be sequenced. Okay, that's the first thing, it needs to be sequenced. So we need to say, uh, what's the difference between um, a year three student and a year six student, and how do they move on in their learning? Not just different activities. Likewise, in secondary schools, it's not, really effective to say well in year seven they do uh, badminton in year nine we do rugby because it's harder it isn't there's no evidence that it's harder it's different we're teaching through activities so it needs to be sequenced and it needs to be logical and we all need to have a, a basic understanding of that and it isn't narrowed even for academy schools it is exemplified by the national curriculum which is the next slide please so this document for many schools we, we don't always dig deeply enough, I think, as we and as we should have done. And I'm certainly doing some work with many schools, including secondaries and primaries, about really getting underneath what is in the curriculum. So, for example, um, when you look at physical education for a key stage, or even over two key stages, it's only around two pages long. That doesn't mean to say there's not much to it. It needs to be it's really thought through and unpicked and a curriculum mapped. That, that builds this in and takes this in. So there's some good work going on. And if not, there's perhaps just some work needed um, in schools where they're not actually tackling this and really digging beneath it as perhaps we could do. 
Next slide, please. This is the poster, and it'll, it'll come to light just as we look at the PE premium at the end. Um, we really need to understand and remind ourselves of this difference between physical education, school sport, and physical activity. Physical education is what we are trying to, to do. That's the whole purpose. We are educating through the physical. And again, these posters are available uh, for anybody to use should they need to do. And uh, they're on the AFP website, but it's that part. And the reason it's very important is because you remember the work that Joe Wicks was doing over the summer and he and called the, he or whoever called him the nation's PE teacher. He wasn't. He did some excellent work in keeping people active. He did fitness type classes and so on. But what he didn't do was educate through the physical. And what we now need to do, which is why I go back to that reframe of the curriculum, is remind ourselves that the physical activity that he did was very, very useful. And you can carry on using it, but it wasn't physical education. So in the best schools, we've still got an understanding of physical education. But in some schools, there is this notion that we really have to go back and remind people what physical education is. Because the last thing we want is this new world to be when somebody presses um, presses the video from a Joe Wicks video and thinks that's physical education. It's not. It needs to be a thought to thought of in the same way as akin to the Daily Mile, where it's a very useful activity, but it's an addition and it's an attempt to keep people up. Uh, next slide, please. So the second part, we have the intent. Once you know what you're trying to achieve, then you've got your implementation. What's the key things that we're looking for in terms of, if you look at the criteria from the education inspection framework, we've just drawn these out into, into words really, just to highlight what's, what's needed. It was the importance of good subject knowledge. It was making sure that the teaching wasn't over elaborate because there's no need to have 30 lesson plans. Let's get to the core of what's needed. And effectively, it's a knowledge-based curriculum where you're helping pupils to remember long-term content. In other words, it's now being called learn the curriculum. So effectively, should logically sequence and scaffold and move, move forward using that national curriculum as the benchmark. I like the fact that we've now got mentioned in there that assessment is used effectively. So it's for the purposes of learning and to help with what's going on in, in your lessons and reducing burdens on staff. We, could, we couldn't, as inspectors, mention that really in the past because it didn't necessarily dire directly impact on, it wasn't actually in the framework, should we say. So now, if we've got some, some schools asking for data drops far too regularly and they're not making any sense, that question can be asked as to why you're doing that. So there is good, some good work going on around useful assessment approaches. And the last point there, which is from the criteria, is just matching up your work with students uh, of, of what's going through. OK, so uh, next slide, please. And then the final point and the reason we, this is if you look at the impact box, you, had, you, you decide you knew what you wanted to do. You construct your curriculum and then you want to see if it's working. And most importantly, we're talking about impact is including national tests and examinations. So it is perfectly possible for a school with lower scores on the door, shall we say, to have a, a better inspection outcome than a school that's got higher scores on the doors. So you can't really compare school by school, even though they're five miles apart and say, well, look at their data. It's not just about data, it's including. And that's actually was outlined by Amanda Spearman in one of her, her talks around six months ago. So that's very, very important. Uh, what is important there is that they are next stage ready. So across your key stages, have you made the primaries, made them ready for the secondary school? Your early years, are they ready to enter the more formal type education that they experience at key stage one and so on? So next stage is literally moving through. And in secondaries, that next stage ready talks about reference to um, being ready for going into college, going into uh, apprenticeships and so on. So you can see how physical education can fit in there quite neatly, neatly and work across the curriculum is good quality. So no longer should the focus be on English and maths, as an example, there to two key subjects. A lot of subjects may be considered, and if you look at the way deep dives work, they certainly look at those and it's of good quality. So it's very, very important that each, every subject counts. Next slide, please. 
And uh, just a final one there, because I'm not going through the whole framework, but just to say, if you look at the personal development section, and it alludes to what, uh, what I mentioned earlier on, physical education has a massive part to play in ensuring good outcomes for students. Spiritual, moral, social and cultural development has been around uh, since the 1988 Education Reform Act. We still have it in there. And if we had time, we could literally do a task where everybody would come up with uh, ways of way, ways in which physical education could contribute to each of those. It's massive. OK, so I think that's really important, as is character, the second point, resilience, independence. And I, I referenced um, the text that I, we published in 2011 and the explicit part is knowing how to eat healthily, maintain an active lifestyle and keep physically and mentally healthy. That's a whole school approach. So the judgment is about the whole school, but physical education has a, uh, a huge part to play. But that's very different to promoting, helping them to maintain it rather than fitness scores. So we're not asking for you know, a monitoring of fitness to see if you've got the children fit. It's your encouragement of it and the promotion of it and its place in the world. Next slide, please. I'm moving on quickly. I've, I've tagged in two things because I'm giving you there the ideal. So that's what we said. Six to 12 months ago, we were talking at that level, and that's why I wanted to reset that. What is our barrier? It is without doubt COVID. COVID-19, you can see how I've not even put 19 on there. It's almost become, it's just such a part of the language now. So it's so annoying that it's out there, but it is. Uh, and just to say that the, the reference to that you need to follow is, you'll all know this anyway, it's the, it's the returning to schools on the gov.uk. There was a little bit of confusion, uh, because sometimes they direct you to that website and you look at that document, uh, it will direct you onto the DCMS pages, uh, which look at uh, clubs and community settings. That, and then it's, it, it starts to say, well, that, how does that impact on schools? That's actually designed for clubs and community settings. And just to remind you, as a school, you have got the ability to make your own decisions, which we'll, come, we'll talk about at the moment. So there are no... Uh, barriers in terms of numbers and those numbers that are being referred to in the community settings document are causing a bit of confusion it's up to each school to come to its own decision through its own risk assessments so next slide please you'll see if you go onto the active website we have interpreted the guidance that gov.uk guidance and we are we're updating it regularly importantly your employer makes the final decision so if you are the employer, it's you. If you're a local authority school and still in there, it's the local authority makes that decision. If not, it's the board of trustees and the governors if you're in a different setup of a kind of school. But the, the DfE guidance is there as such. We've held meetings with them uh, where they've made that very clear. There is still a flexibility for schools. There is not a right and wrong. There are not a, there's not a list of activities and so on you can and, and cannot do. There's a flexibility. So just to keep it, keep it real, shall we say, it, what would be best practice, this is certainly APA's position and certainly my position, is to still be planning your ideal quick curriculum and then modifying it, okay? So it's start your curriculum, modify it, and then think of COVID afterwards, rather than providing the, a COVID curriculum because the COVID curriculum will be quite limiting. So let's keep in mind what we want and then just adjust it. And then the decisions around PE and school sport are around equipment use, bubbles, contact, cleaning between groups and activities and so on. They are a school decision. Okay, so um, can we have contact in lessons? Can they touch each other? Which is one example. Well, um, in reality, because it's not mentioned that you can't, yes, you can but it's actually what your risk assessment says in your own school setting. After position is that we would still wouldn't recommend contact in PE lessons or as little contact as possible in PE lessons. However, it's up to you to make the decision, but what we would have uh, plead for is some consistency because this appears to be little point saying we won't have contact in physical education at the moment, but then in, in their bubbles at playgrounds and in lunchtime, they're jumping all over each other and high-fiving and piggybacking like normal students would do at that age. So the problem needs to be a consistency across there. And all those things at that bottom line are school decisions that can be made. And um, you know we've updated that guidance to, to try and help you. 
Next slide, please. So key message, it's planning a high quality curriculum still, needs based. So you need to listen to your students uh, and those uh, if you're involved in the in the secondary program, for example, the secondary teacher training program, those involved in that have got the Sheffield Hallam surveys to really help them to get student voice going. All activities can be taught. There is now, there's not, we often, as a health and safety leader, I often get questions, can we teach this activity and that activity? You can teach anything as long as it adheres to your, the rules that your school has set based on the guidance itself. Up until about two months ago, we couldn't sweet, teach swimming. We've worked with Swim England now and swimming can be taught and there's a very good document from Swim England to, to help you to get to re-engage in, in, in swimming. So at that point, we couldn't, we can now. But please don't, you know, this is a plea for me really, don't plan a COVID curriculum. Please, you know, go back to think of it as what the students need and just adapt it and modify it for that period of time. And we know that the rules are changing. Uh, I, I, I'm talking here now thinking what rules have been changed today. I've not been on the gov.uk web, website and uh, we've got Boris coming tonight with some further announcements and being in the north, I'm quite fearful on that one. Um, keep the SL team informed and on board and that's like some of the uh, posters before may help you uh, and do not replace physical education with physical activity, particularly in the primary setting where they've had this Joe Wicks um, concept and again, that's not to criticise Joe Wicks, it's just to say he was doing a good thing, but it wasn't physical education. Uh, next slide, please. So just to finish off, um, to come to be the end of this section before I spend a couple of moments on um, the PE premium itself. The, my mantra, and anybody seen me speak before has always been that we do not worry about Ofsted. Never do anything for Ofsted, ever. But as I've said there, particularly this term, because if you get one of these visits and we'll give you just we'll show you about that in a moment. If you get a visit between now and January, it's going to be a, a visit and it's not going to be an inspection and it's going to be collaborative conversations. And I've been hearing quite positive things from what I've been reading about schools have been visited at the moment, almost saying if only it was like this all the time. So what they will potentially be doing is talking to schools, find out what the problems are, and it will form the evidence base for the national picture. My concern is around Ofsted not coming, which is quite interesting, isn't it? Because I'm now saying I wish Ofsted would come in, in some way, is because if physical education was not on the curriculum, at the moment, the chances are it just being identified that it isn't on the curriculum, Whereas if it had been appearing like that in what we might call a normal inspection, it may have been picked up as a key issue and asked why physical education is not on the curriculum. And I speak from my daughter's school, um, you know, I, I went in a few weeks ago and physical education was not on the curriculum. It's an outstanding school. Uh, I questioned it, worked with the deputy head and physical education is now back on the curriculum. And when I had the discussions, it was largely because they were almost looking for somebody to confirm that it would be OK to put PE back on the curriculum. And trust me, it is. So it wasn't a criticism of the school. They were listening. They weren't looking for that support. It's back on. It's a difficult job, but it's important. So next slide, please. And this was the in, uh, 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 a, a talk from um, Amanda Spielman last week. I've missed an, an, an O off there. It wasn't it was wasn't that long ago. It does have an O on it. And from the early visit, they were reporting that physical education is vital because the physical activity itself should be there. And they're already noticing this decline in physical activity and teachers are telling them this. Next slide, please. So if you get um, visited in January, when we return to what we might call normal inspection and keep your eyes on that one, because that still could potentially change. The chances of being visiting PE is potentially increased. It is not a physical education correct, um, inspection. You are just being sampled to see if the systemic approaches off your, across your school are working. I would always say direct the inspector because the chances are that the inspector may be a non-specialist. So if you really speak with passion and logic and your SLT and your middle leadership team and your teachers can say the same thing and show how you're going somewhere and see what difference you're making, then I think usually they can't fail to be impressed. It's up to you to just to, to direct them, show them the impact that you're having. 
and really celebrate out your work because if you have a deep dive uh, which is not the part of the place of today to talk about. If you have a deep dive, that's a great opportunity to say why your curriculum is as it is, how you're fitting into the whole school agenda and the difference you're making. But please celebrate what you're doing and sing and dance about it. Next slide, please. So it's plan your ideal. And the next slide, that's one, one key message on that slide. There's a couple of um, that um, posters that we've designed from AFPE to help you in your thinking. So that's the front page of it. Next slide, please. That's the back page of it. And it's the that may be a, a useful document, and you can go onto the website and get these. Um, sorry, back one more. Yeah, the you can go onto the website, and you can get these, and they will help you if you answer honestly. You can really see if this is where you're at as a as a curriculum design. Okay, next slide. So last. Just to conclude this section before we have a couple of slides just to look at the premium curriculum balance. If you're thinking about it, think about learning and not activities. So how does the learning progress each year? Not just an activity map. You want a learning map of how you've gone through. Um, when you look at your activities, this is a challenge to you in all of your schools. Just check the balance and see which activities you're teaching. And is it games dominated? Do an activity map in the sense of uh, thinking about how much gymnastic activity, how much dance and so on. And often you might be surprised because you could be heavily, heavily dominated because you're thinking, well, we've got invasion games, we've got net games, striking and fielding, but they're all games and you might be narrowing it somewhat for yourselves. And what, this, what do your students think? When was the last time you asked your students, as I alluded to earlier? Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm not going to go through this. It's a slide that you, you're, you can have afterwards. It's the start, the thought process of if you've reviewed using the previous um, documents, I've had a really good, honest self review. These are the type of things and the steps you may take if you want to review and reflect on your curriculum. And I'm hoping we can work that up into a useful planning tool that will help people. But if you look through, it should be quite helpful and quite logical and help you to plan through. But we're not doing a planning workshop. It's just leaving you some ideas of what you, you might do. Next slide, please. That is the headline, though. When you are planning, and that's the importance in the framework, when you are planning, is everybody included? How do you know? Have you spoken to them? And how can you meet their needs differently? So, for example, could some, in some occasions, could you be doing a theme, but doing it through different activities? to meet different needs. That's just a thought, and I'll leave that one out where up with you, but that's key in the inspection, education inspection framework. Next slide, please. That's just a bit of a reminder. If you haven't purchased the new safe practice document, it, it well, good, a good advice would be to do so because it's the one that judiciary has used in anything. It's, uh, just been published in September, and obviously it will last four years. Myself and the other two members of the health and safety team wrote it. So we think it's been rewritten and updated to, to help you. So just to remind you, if you haven't done that, um, well worth purchasing because it's got some great frequently asked questions there as well. I would say that because I, I was one of the authors, but it has, trust me. Uh, okay, next slide. See the final ones because we're just finishing now. Uh, I may end up going a few, just a couple of minutes over simply because I was asked by Sue to, to put these in just to remind you. Uh, and again, I won't go through everything in detail because you can all read on these slides, but I'll just draw out um, key things. And the, the couple of key things there is that the, um, the money can be rolled over from last year and you can also attach it to this year. So there should be some good funding available for the primary school to use in there. Um, work each of those points as we go through that list is valid. But that point at the bottom there, what if this is the last year of funding? We haven't got a crystal ball. We don't know. Uh, I certainly don't know. But I, what I do know is all the spending from government, which is unparalleled and unheard of, has to be paid back in some way. And, you know, typically physical education has been low profile. I hope I'm wrong and I hope this stays. But what if it is the last year of the funding? Next slide, please. Okay, so 
it's got to be additional sustainable beyond what you would do in your normal curriculum okay so it's not just to replace your curriculum it's to supplement it and to build capacity and the pe national curriculum and the sports pre p and sports premium should complement each other it's very very important that they complement each other and afp is based on what we're seeing and what's been written and what you need to do these two points at the bottom are important after pro proposes that you should have a look at transition and link it wherever possible to the secondary teacher training program because the secondary teacher training program is in its last phase it's being it's given funding through national lottery to improve the quality of secondary schools so maybe there's some opportunity to think across both sets of schools to think as an element of joined up join upness even if you can you know you actually um use the funding in different pots which you have to do and continuity progression and challenge should be at the the fore of everything we do next slide please ask his advice so remember this is from the national uh, p and uh, sport premium uh, good doc, the, sorry, the advice from government, but in, and DFE, the impact is about the pupils, not the teachers. So if you do something with teachers, it should always be so that things get better for pupils. Okay, so we use, you can include benchmark data on well-being, physical well-being, and so on. If you want to know your starting points, and it's, it's important to use qualitative and quantitative measurement. We're not scientists here, research scientists. We don't need everything. Uh, with um, statistical tests on it. It's just what ways can you show that things are improved? And sometimes words work as well as anything else. They're concise and sustainable. And even though we said that second to bottom point there is even though we said they are different PE, school sport and physical activity, they do overlap. And you can plan for each of them in your uh, curriculum, uh, in your PE spend. So think about each of them, remember the different plan for each of them. And then the final slide, please. OK, so that was it. I think that was it. Yeah, I've covered. So that was that was me. Uh, and that last part, as I say, was just tagged on because it's very, very important. Even though I've attached it on is that let's think about can we get good spend and use it effectively? Hey, thank thank you. you. That was uh, that was fantastic. A lot to get through. A lot of content. You were loud and clear, even to us Midlanders. So thank, <laughs> you, thank you for rattling through that. Um, we've we've got a couple of minutes because we can pinch it back. So um, I'm just going to pick out one or two questions. If I uh, I can throw them at you, um, you might have touched on this anyway. Uh, first question was: um, Have you got good examples of summative assessment? Okay. Um, well, the answer to that is no, because there you, each school has to do it in its own way. What we have got a good example of is that what we should be focusing on is the formative assessment and the summative has perhaps dominated our work because what we sometimes think more about our recording and our endpoints than what we've done on our way. So one of the, the books uh, that we've produced, well, and Andy Fratwell was the key author on behalf of AFP. He wrote a book, Assessment Without Levels. And if you actually work through that, that really helps you to think, not just in physical education terms, it could happen for any subject, in particular the foundation subjects, thinking about what you're trying to achieve and why, and then you embed and build in your recording mechanisms reflected on that. So then at least you know the information that you've gathered has done the job, uh, which is actually just seeing if they've got to the points they should technically be at the end of the national curriculum, and you can use that for the next stage. And that's the most important thing, that any information that you collect should be able to use the next stage. So if you've, I mean, I'll go through my own teaching career. I, when I was teaching in secondary schools, I was collecting reams and reams of paper. When I look back, I couldn't use any of it. I was, just thought I was doing a good job and I wasn't. I was just collecting information that I couldn't use. You know, and I went through that process and now it's less is more. So really, it's just collecting only the most pertinent information. But that book, Assessment Out, Out Levels, is a real good read because it takes you towards the information you should collect. OK, thank you, sir. Great tip. Um, let's go one more and then we can wrap up. Um, have you any examples, areas of good practice where you've seen senior leaders in schools previously not engaged or supportive of PESPA to change their focus? Um, it's a tricky one from my perspective. I've got some good examples 
um, perhaps coming through, and they're only just coming through from the secondary project, because one of my other roles is I lead for AFPI on the secondary project, but they're just coming through, and they're only just being written up as impact case studies. So it's a question of watch this space, and we'll certainly push, publish them on the AFPI website and in PE Matters, the journal. Uh, so from my perspective, no, but also I think that's a question worth firing in and we can send to AFPI as well, because um, they, Sue, Sue Wilkinson deals more with the impact from the PE premium, so we may have some gems for you from the primary phase if you want. If, if we can email, email that as a separate question over to AFPI. Wonderful. Yeah, that'd be most welcome. Um, yeah. And you've been you've been very straight, very honest, but I, but I do like the fact that you said it. I liked what you opened with that your glass is half full. It's a temporary new normal, um, and let's not lose sight of where. Uh, where we were, you know, where we got to. So uh, I want to just say on behalf of everyone, Steve, thanks for your thanks for your time today and being part of our conference. No problem at all. Thank you very much. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, um, we're going to go straight into our third presenter um, of this section, um, and I want to welcome our very own uh, Jane Pillar, School Sport Advisor at Sport Birmingham. Welcome, Jane. Do you want to take over? Okay, thank you, Mike. How do I follow those two? But I'll give it a go. Graveyard spot, but here we go. <laughs> Pathway to podium then, what's it all about? Some of you may have heard of it. Some of you may have been involved with the pilot. Some of you may have been involved with the consultation. Um, some of you may be completely new to you. So hopefully at the end of this 20 minutes, you'll have an idea of where it came from, what does it consist of? And most importantly, how your school can get involved. Now, this initiative has been in development for about 12 months now. About 12 months ago, we set up a working party and that consisted of a selection of head teachers from across Birmingham. So that was primary school, secondary and special. We also had a number of representatives from the senior leadership teams of schools. Um, a couple of our school games organisers who represented the school games network and obviously uh, ourselves at Sport Birmingham. So we had a working group. We've also been in liaison throughout the 12 months with our two main national partners, which is the Association for Physical Education, Sue Wilkinson, and also um, Jim at U Sport Trust. So thank you for everyone who's been being involved. So what we wanted to try and do then is design something that recognise the excellent work that goes on in schools around PE, school, sport and physical activity. There is some fantastic work going on and how, do, how could we recognise that? We want you to celebrate the positive work that the schools are doing in this particular area, but also as well alongside that to support schools to improve their offer. So those schools that maybe weren't um, as good, maybe looking at how do we help those to ensure that there's an offer for the benefit of our children and young people at Ross Birmingham. And as being mentioned during the first presentation, we've got a fantastic opportunity now through 2022, the Commonwealth Games, and how do we link and ensure this Pathway to Podium initiative is going to be designed to link in and make sure our main aim which is the national aim as well as our local vision at Sport Birmingham to ensure that try and increase the opportunities for our children and young people to be active for a minimum of 60 minutes a day. A big challenge, but maybe an opportunity to, to help that process. Thanks, James. So how does it work then? Just to give you a, a very simple idea. It's based on a set of criteria. And there's five criteria around the five Ps, which are profile, participation, performance, people, and places. So profile section is around, focuses on literally raising the profile of being a sport sport as a tool for whole school improvement. So areas within that section will include around the national curriculum, around swimming, obviously in primary, around senior leadership support, which was just mentioned in a question, and around generally marketing and profile of being sport. So that's the profile question. The participation question then is ensuring the engagement of all our pupils in regular physical activity. 
So areas in this will be around active travel, active mile, active breaks, active lessons, etc. The third P, performance, is the focus on engagement of competitive opportunities for all pupils. So inter-school events, gifted and talented, etc. The fourth one, people, is development, a very important area, the development of people, pupils, staff, governors, parents, the whole school network. And how do we do that? Through leadership, volunteering opportunities for our children and young people, opportunities for staff learning, um, training for governors or equivalent in whichever school set of you are. And the final one around places, so development of school links with local community sport, an activity network, an extracurricular and out of hours engagement. So school club links, extracurricular clubs, opening of school facilities. So the five P's, we've, we've got a number of questions around those, particularly hopefully that outlines a little bit what that means. So how will the initiative work? Well, schools will complete a self-assessment. Very simple, I'll show you an example of what the screen will look like in a moment. So they complete a very simple, basic self-assessment of those five key areas and a couple of other questions. And through a partnership team that looks at those, those assessments that come in, linked with our school games organisers, linked with our national partners, Youth Sport Trust and AFP, we'll just give a rating around from silver or gold based on the responses. The most important step then after that is we're looking to support schools with an action plan. So if they wish to have help around certain areas they may need support on, we'll work again alongside our partners um, to enhance that offer of peace, school sport and physical activity to basically improve the outcomes of our young people, which is the most important thing at the end of the day. Next slide, James, please. Okay, this shows what it will look like. So for each of the P's, you will see a number of questions, number of criteria, as you can see down the left-hand side. It's very glossy, it's very colourful, and hopefully, fingers crossed, it will be very simple for you to complete. So for each of the five P's, and there's an example on the screen here for primary around profile. So the working group have selected a number of criteria for each of the P's. So for example, for profile for primary, we've got curriculum PE, we've got swimming, senior leadership support and profile and communication. And what we've done then, we've got a number of questions located there, 1.2 points or three points, and the school then have to have a look at that and give themselves a score. So if they feel all year groups are offered one hour of PE, give themselves a one. If they feel that all groups are offered two hours or more a week, and that's a factual thing, then they give themselves the three points. So they go through each of the criteria. And there's a very quick and simple self-assessment tool to where, where they're at at that point in time. On the right hand side then, on the white box, you can see I've just given some examples here of additional supporting information. So if you've got links to support some of that criteria, so it could be a curriculum map, a scheme of work, it could be linked to your Peace School Sport Premium Plan, a link to the school website, wherever you feel there is additional supporting information that could be added in that box, um, just include it in there um, and that will be useful information as well. We're very conscious, as been mentioned throughout this afternoon, of the current climate in COVID. So obviously in the, the right-hand box again, if any of these criteria have been affected by COVID, which I presume a lot of them will be, then again, just put comments in there and we'll take that on board for each individual school. So we'll have, as I said, the five piece plus a couple of additional questions so schools will have this on the on, on, on a form and complete it as a, as a self-assessment tool um, and then submit it to Sport Birmingham. So we've been through a pilot phase, we've made um, these changes, this is what's been recommended now through head teachers in the working group um, so hopefully this, this, this will be a starter and be able to support schools. James if you just go on to the next slide for me please. Thank you. So at the end of the submission, you'll get a very quick, brief overview 
of where your school is at the moment. Um, so as you can see, it's all colour coded. It just gives you an idea of where maybe the gaps are, maybe areas for improvement, etc. As I said, we are conscious of the current climate with COVID. We're conscious of where you're at and the workloads that you all have and the adaptations you're having to make. Um, we've been working on this a while, so we're, we're launching it today. So hope, hopefully uh, we're, we're all in the same boat. We're all trying to support each other. What I have said um, previously uh, in one of my previous slides is then we see this really as a development tool, um, a development initiative. So we have a self-assessment and then we work with schools if they'd like us to support them on an action plan, working with our school games organisers, with Birmingham City Council colleagues, Youth Sport Trust, AFPE, for all of our colleagues to help the schools to, to get where they want to and have good practice, share good practice amongst schools, have peer support, um, webinar training as and when required, etc., etc. Thanks, James. So how do you get involved then? As I say, we're all in a difficult climate as we are, but hopefully um, you'll see a benefit from this and um, all the benefits that, that potentially schools, and um, particularly our children and young people will, will get from it. It's open as today. So this is the official launch. As Mike said, we were hoping to be at Edgbaston Stadium, but we are sitting in my kitchen and, and sitting in your homes or schools environment as we speak. So it's launched from today. Information is on the website as of now. So if you're interested now, please sign up. If you want to start in December, January, next year, it doesn't particularly matter. So when you feel if your school is interested and you're ready to be involved with this really exciting initiative, partnership initiative, um, then please sign up when you feel is appropriate. We also have the website there, schools at sportbirmingham.org. So if you've got any questions, any queries, please send them through to us and James and or I will answer them on, on your behalf. So that hopefully just gives a very quick whistle stop tour. As I've mentioned earlier, we did have a working party to develop this that's been working over the last 12 months. And one of our head teachers, some of you may know, Denise Townsend, who's a head teacher at Dame Ellen Pinson School, has been involved with this from day one. I've known Denise a very long time. And she was involved initially, along with other head teachers as well, and senior leaders helped us develop this initiative um, to where it is today. Unfortunately, Dean is, was hoping to be with us, but can't be. She's been called to chair a special education uh, head meeting, um, but she's kindly done a brief video from home for us. Um, so if I put you onto the next slide, James, if you could show that video. Thank you. Hello, my name's Denise Fountain. I'm the head teacher of Dame Ellen Pinsent Special School in Birmingham. Um, I've been working alongside um, a few different colleagues in the city um, in different schools and also with Jane Pillar at Sport Birmingham. Um, regarding the Commonwealth Games, uh, we're really keen as heads to ensure the children and young people of Birmingham really do get um, benefit from us hosting the Commonwealth Games. It's a fantastic opportunity for our city and we truly believe our young people should benefit from this. Um, the pathway to podium was, uh, was a result of some of the work we've been doing together um, and we've been looking at how can we really recognise the great work we're doing as schools around the PN School Sport agenda. Um, it really is there to support schools so give them a springboard opportunity to go further with all the opportunities children are offered. Um, and links closely, obviously, with the national curriculum and all the other agendas we have in school life. But for me, I'm really passionate that we don't miss this opportunity. The Commonwealth Games really is fantastic for Birmingham. And I really feel our children and young people should get benefit from this, should be able to see the athletes in action um, and really inspire them to future health and well-being positive lifestyles, even if not going into 
some sort of professional sports themselves. So yes, inspiration, motivation, but also we mustn't miss the opportunity to learn from other cultures and bring communities together. The amount of different countries that will be visiting us during this period will be fantastic. And again, great learning opportunities for our children. I hope as a result of doing the Pathway to, Pro, uh, Pathway to Podium program that, the, uh, that we gain some rewards. I'd love to see athlete mentors in school, maybe our children going to visit. Some of the training camps or even indeed going to see some of the actual Commonwealth Games in action. So I'm really passionate about it. I really want to see our young people benefit from it and understand what the Commonwealth Games is about. So I look forward to hearing everybody's stories and seeing how people get on with the programme and hope it leads to benefiting ultimately all of the young people in Birmingham. That's great. Thank you. I know, Janice, you're not listening now, but hopefully you'll be reviewing this um, video after. And, and thank you very much for, for doing that. I really appreciate that. Folks, that's hopefully gives you a summary of where we're at. Um, hopefully you're all with me. It's a really exciting initiative. Links in with the Commonwealth, links in with PE School Sport, um, physical activity and a great opportunity to schools whenever they, they wish to be involved and a support tool as well for schools as well. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you as well to all our partners who have been involved going back and forth with consultations, um, national partners and local partners. Really appreciate that. I know we're running out of time. Mike, I'll hand over to you. Uh, if we have got time for a question, I'm happy to take them now. If not, we can do a summary and I can send the responses back so thank you very much for listening everyone that was wonderful jane thank you um oh you're not getting away with it that lightly <laughs> um we shall squeeze one question um but yeah just to emphasize and what uh, denise said it's a simple straightforward you know um opportunity to get association with the games it's uh and as Denise suggested, lots more can come of this. Um, but we've got the we've got the program now. We have the United by branding that uh, can be shared and used by schools who engage with this um, this program. So it, it is an ex a really exciting initiative, and uh, we one of the it's one of the first programs to get the branding. So um, lots to look forward to there. Jane, one question, and then I'm going to. Um, we're going to move on and squeeze in everything we've got to do by three o'clock prompt finish. There's a question here come in. How long will it take to complete the self-assessment and who in the school should complete it? Head teacher or PE lead? Thanks, Mike. Great question, whoever that came from. Um, hopefully it should only take really about 10, 15, 20 minutes to complete the self-assessment. As you can see, it's looking at the criteria thinking whether you're one, two and three and just having an honest gut feeling for your particular school and your young people where you're at. So I'd say a maximum of half an hour personally. Um, that's why we've done it as we have at the moment to, to make it very simple. And an excellent follow up question and I failed to mention it in the presentation, but thank you for picking it up. It should really be a, a, a process between head teacher, PE lead and really a governor or equivalent um, so it may not be a governor in some academies, but an equivalent. So I see, or we see it being sort of a team joint effort between those three particular, three particular parties. So excellent question. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, good answer. It's all about the ownership, isn't it? And the collective ownership. So thank you for that. We're going to move on. Um, we're just on time, which is fantastic. Um, I'm just going to run through before we welcome our our last speaker to close um, the conference. And um, we're coming to this year's PE and Sport Premium Awards. Uh, the awards recognize the outstanding work across the city, lots of it, lots of it that you're involved in on this call uh, with the use of the primary PE and sport funding. This year's awards will be presented to schools at a later date, uh, but this is an opportunity just to give them a proper well-deserved name check and recognize this year's winners. So. We have three categories, um, and I'm just going to just give you a very little bit of background about them. The first one, whole school improvement. 
So the winning school have demonstrated the impact of their funding on pupils in and through PE, including other curriculum subjects and priority school development areas. And the winning school in this category is Oasis Academy Blake and Hale Junior and Infant School. So I'd like to say congratulations to Claire Hoods Truman and all of the staff there. And obviously we would normally have a round of applause, which I haven't worked out how to do on Zoom. So um, we'll just, uh, we'll clap individually um, <laughs> and pretend that we can hear others. Um, second category is upskilling staff. Uh, the winning school have demonstrated the impact of the grant on pupils, increasing confidence, competence and qualifications of school staff, including teachers and teaching assistants. And the winning school in this category is Clifton Primary School. So well done to Owen Lamprey and all the staff there. And the final category is physical activity and health enhancing initiatives. And the winning school have demonstrated the impact of the grant on their pupils engagement in physical activity and health improvement activities. And the final winning school, the winning school in this category is Woodthorpe Junior and Infant School. So congratulations to Matt Trevor and all the staff at Woodthorpe. Um, and that's it, very short and sweet. Um, not the same, is it, as not doing it in person. Um, but we're on time. In fact, yeah, we're, we're ahead of time suddenly because I spoke quite quickly and we didn't have to wait for applause. So if, if we are ready for all our last um, speaker, I've got the pleasure in welcoming our final speaker, Councillor Jane Francis, Cabinet Member for Education, Skills and Culture, um, speaking on behalf of Birmingham City Council. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, pleasure to be here this afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to join you. Um, can I start off by thanking everyone here today from Birmingham schools um, for all their hard work and dedication that they've shown in the, in the past six months, six to nine months of the pandemic. Um, it's been the most challenging and relentless period, I think, for, of our lives. Um, and our working lives and the pressure has not let up so far and we're still all waiting for news this afternoon to see where Birmingham is going to be fixed. Yet despite these challenges, um, I've been struck throughout um, by the commitment of schools to children and families, young people. This has been hugely, hugely appreciated by the whole city and you should all be really, really proud of the contribution that you continue to make. So given the challenging circumstances we're currently living in, um, it's wonderful to be here today and to hear about the launch of the Pathway to the Podium Initiative. Really sorry I couldn't get to you earlier, but other meetings were um, dictating my diary. However, it's so important for children and young people to be healthy and active. And we know that schools play a crucial part in all of this. Pathway to Podium is a really exciting initiative for schools which will encourage children and young people to be more active. It will also support schools to be identified as active schools which helps them access better support and bring more activity into a school's daily routine. From personal experience I know how important being active is. Uh, there are so many of us that are sort of welded to our, our laptops at the moment and one of the I've, I've started doing since lockdown is doing a daily run. Um, I'm a public transport user and was used to do a fair amount of walking, going around the city, and all of a sudden being home based, I wasn't doing that. And I found that, that quite therapeutic, even when the weather's not so good. Um, so this, this daily run has been really beneficial to me, I think, mentally as well as physically. And it's a habit I'll definitely be keeping up. As a council, we're really supportive of active schools and pathways to the podium, which we'll see as a key way the legacy of the Commonwealth Games will be embedded with it within schools. Recent global events may have somewhat overshadowed Birmingham's preparations for hosting the Commonwealth Ga Games in 2022. And we know that some parts of the city have struggled to see what benefits the Games will bring to them. But it will be there, absolutely will be there. This initiative will be one of the ways the Games will make a real and lasting impact on the health and well-being of Birmingham's children that will last for years to come. I would encourage all of you 
to be part of the pathway to podium and i really look forward to seeing it introduced in schools across the city in coming months thank you so much everybody and the best of luck do let me know if i can be of any further help here won't you Jane, thank you very much and thank thank you for the endorsement it means a lot uh, and and to and to bring the the virtual conference to a close let's hope let's hope we're back to uh let's hope we're back to normal or whatever new normal or temporary normal we are in next year and we can all be together in person we've had a a really good attendance today not quite the hundred that we were going to have in person but i think considering as you say how people are so exhausted almost by uh, by the number of screen meetings i would like to thank everyone for for staying with us for um, a really uh, a really full on couple of hours um so you've earned a cuppa now if you haven't had time to to make one i'd like to thank all of the speakers um all of the team for putting it together and, and say everyone for for attending today and being with us um it always feels just slightly strange talking to a a, a slide and a, and a blank screen and pretending that there's people out there um, listening. So I hear that there's still 50 or 60 or 70 of you around. Um, so I'd like to thank you. It means a lot that um, the efforts that have been put into the conference uh, have been listened to. Um, a reminder that the recording of the, the full event will be available on the Sport Birmingham website afterwards. So please, um, signal people to that and share it uh, wide and far and um, get involved get involved through the um, pathway to podium initiative to link yourself to the brand that we've got the uh, recognition the accreditation for and stay in touch with us and we'll we'll keep communicating with you uh, to help you get involved more closely with the commonwealth games and i'll um, i'll make sure that i do some nagging so that we get that information about the learning program out to all of you as soon as uh, Ian and his team have more details on that, because I know a number of head teachers from meetings up to now have felt that um, they haven't really had the engagement they would have liked by this stage, but you've heard it earlier that uh, it's coming. Uh, it's just taken a little bit uh, longer to, uh, to be made public. So, thank you everyone. We're gonna sign off now, which means that uh, you've got 10 minutes more of your day um, than we promised to keep you for. Um, but thank you again and we'll speak again soon.